Genetics is a hot topic these days, and it's important that you understand the basics before moving on to your genetics course and your advanced genetics course, both of which are required for your biology major. And so really what we're going to be doing is practicing understanding how to solve genetics problems. And I think it's really key to recognize that the study of genetics is tied directly to the process of meiosis. You'll remember from page 261 in your textbook that the process of mitosis results in four daughter cells and that those four daughter cells are each different from one another and different also from the parent cell. And of course, what do we call these cells, these daughter cells at the end of meiosis II? We call them gametes. If they're small and produced by the male, we call them sperm cells. If they're larger and nutrient rich, produced by the female, we call them egg cells. And in fertilization, they recombine to form a new individual with a unique set of DNA, different from all other individuals, and that individual has the correct amount of DNA for the organism. When we consider genetics, we're not only considering animals, not only fungi, but we could also be considering plants, for example. Of course, we're talking about anything that reproduces sexually by producing egg cells and sperm cells. So if we think about a plant, and the plant has a flower, and the flower has male and female parts, when the female part, the ovary, when its eggs are fertilized, that creates the new individuals. So if you've ever held a pod of peas in your hand, what you're holding is the ripened ovary, and when you open that pea pot up and you look inside to find those peas, each of those individual peas are offspring from that individual pea plant. So there was a pea plant parent, oh that's hard to say, a pea plant parent, and that pea plant parent had many flowers. Each flower produced egg and sperm cells. When those eggs were fertilized, then it resulted in the peas. The peas contain the embryonic plant. So if you buy a packet of pea seeds to plant in your garden, you're really buying a whole packet of embryos contained within the seed, ready to grow into new individual pea plants. So at the end of meiosis II, when we have haploid daughter cells, well, what if we picked a single cell and tracked it to see what kind of new individual would form depending on what sperm cell we pick? And if we were thinking about plants, well, that same plant flower might have provided the egg cell and the sperm cell. And when those are recombined in fertilization, then we form a new individual pea plant with the embryo contained within that seed. And so the pea seed contains the embryo that's basically the product of fertilization between the male and female gamete, between egg cell and sperm. So animal cells can provide useful genetic models and provide the basis for a lot of really interesting studies, but they usually are pretty limited in the number of offspring they have. In fact, most mammals, even mice, which might have large numbers of offspring, or cats, we're still thinking of 10 or fewer offspring in most cases. But plants provide an excellent model for studying genetics because they have so many offspring. As I'm recording this, the corn is just beginning to ripen in the fields. And so here you see a full field of corn, many, many plants. And I think that you can see here at one tip some of the structures of the male flower, which grows at the top of the corn stalk. Now the female flowers of the plant grow along the sides of the stalk, not up at the top. And so what we're looking at here is the corn silk that's going to be associated with the production of the female parts of the plant. And in fact, each of those silks represents the stigma and style and travels to an ovary that contains a single egg. And so we're going to see that this corn ear develops from the female flower parts. Here you see a corn ear that's significantly more developed. The silk has shriveled because the, each of those eggs has already been fertilized and the embryonic corn plants are forming inside each and every corn kernel inside this ear. And finally, I think everybody's familiar with the final product. So here's an ear of corn 
with the covering stripped away, that corn husk, and you can see each individual kernel inside. Each individual kernel represents one offspring, the combination of one egg cell and one sperm cell to recombine and form a new diploid individual. And so just in this one ear of corn, we can study maybe 500 offspring produced by a single parent plant. So how do we go about studying human genetics? Well, we can collect small amounts of data over a long period of time, or we can also study in model organisms, usually animals, that will give us an idea about the inner workings of genetics in humans and gradually scale up from there. So be sure to check out the chapter review in chapter 17. I wanted to point out that there are some additional practice questions for you in the self-test at the end of the chapter. Work on some of those genetics problems outside of class and look for some resources online as well so you have a firm grasp of how to solve genetics problems by the end of the lab period and by the time you go in for your quiz the following week.